are a lot of reports of giants being found in Kentucky and they correlate directly with the Adena Mound Builder sites and in fact the Adena Mound Builders of Kentucky disappeared at the time of the arrival of the Europeans. So where did they go? Hi, my name is Jenna Bosiger, and you're watching my Cryptic Cryptids YouTube channel. Thank you for watching, liking, and subscribing. I really do appreciate it. Kentucky Giants. Now I'm going to get into reports of giants from onlyinyourstate.com, Kentucky Things Archaeologist Franklin Giants. Giants over nine feet tall was found in a burial mound on a farm 12 feet beneath the surface. There were copper bands around the neck and the skull fit over the top of a normal head with extra space. And in a cave near Louisville, Kentucky, two men claimed to have discovered three different skeletons which they believed to be Kentucky giants. Each of these measured nine feet tall. The ancient community in Paradise, Kentucky is now home to over 1,200 burials along with hearths, pottery, projectiles, and over 65,000 artifacts that are staggering, that are a staggering 5,300 years ancient burial mound in Richmond has been attributed to the Adena culture in Kentucky. A rock ledge along the eastern central area of the Kentucky Creek held the remains of an 8-foot, 9-inch skeleton, causing more rumors of the infamous, you guessed it, Kentucky Giants to Swirl. Goes on to say Kentucky has burial mounds in almost every county, some more prominent than others. Many have been destroyed over the years due to residential development. From medium.com, understanding reality, examples of proof that giants existed. The Kentucky Dover Mound is a large Native American burial ground within which was found the seven foot tall skeleton of an Indina man. What is more interesting than that, than his height, was his abnormally elongated head and disproportionately large torso in relation to his legs. And at Native American burial grounds in Ohio, similar remains were found of incredibly tall men with elongated heads and disproportionately large torsos. The Mount Horeb earthworks are in Kentucky, two ancient sites that offer a fascinating glimpse into the past. The Portsmouth group of earthworks that continues on the other side of the Ohio River in Ohio and on the other side in Kentucky. It was a massive place that had been used for thousands of years until the arrival of the Europeans when they all disappeared. What happened to mound builders trying to coexist as a mound builder, a giant mound builder with humans sharing the land. Come on. Was that really ever a possibility or an option? Allies or enemies didn't matter. We wanted their land and we wanted all the resources, and we took them. And so here's the report of giants being found, giant skeletons being found in the burial mounds in Kentucky. From the Corinth, Kentucky Independent. Some weeks ago, a mound was discovered on the Kentucky River below Carrollton. A party of men excavated it, and on digging down for 10 feet, were surprised to find three human skeletons of gigantic size. They were between two layers of ashes, with their heads extending towards the setting sun. The bones were of monstrous size, and from the manner of burial form of skeleton, they were beyond doubt a relic of the mound builders, that ancient race who occupied this continent hundreds of years ago. The arms and legs were literally covered with curious shaped beads, several of which were given to us by one of the party who discovered the cave. 
The beads seem to be constructed from the teeth of some animal and are in perfect condition. Just handing them out. How did they attach beads to their arms? Arms and legs were literally covered with curious shaped beads. Tells me they might have been attached to hair. Giants skeletons found. Petersburg, Kentucky. Five Human skeletons of giant size were found buried a few feet below the surface of the sidewalk between the post office to Chrysler's hotel while excavating for a sewer. A prehistoric burying ground is supposed to have been located here. This I found, and it says, Bluegrass historian Lewis Collins published historical sketches of Kentucky in 1848. It includes the following description of giant human remains found by the early settler John Payne at Augusta, near the Ohio River in Bracken County during 1792, Payne wrote. The bottom on which Augusta is situated is a large burying ground of the ancients. A post hole cannot be dug without turning up human bones. They have been found in great numbers and of all sizes everywhere be between the mouths of Bracken and the lo and Locust Creeks, a distance of about a mile and a half. From the cellar under my dwelling, 60 by 70 feet, 110 skeletons were taken. I numbered them by the skulls, and there might have been many more whose skulls had crumbled into dust. The skeletons were of all sizes from seven feet to the infant. David Kilgore, who was, ta who was a tall and very large man, passed by our village at a time I was excavating my cellar and we took him down and applied a thigh bone to his, the owner, if well proportioned, must have been some 10 or 12 inches taller than Kilgore and the lower jawbone would slip over his skin and all. Who were they? How came their bones there? It goes on to say, the Elizabethtown Register records the findings among the sands of Rolling Fork. 12 miles from that place of the thigh bone of a human being which measures in cubic inches six times the size of the thigh bone of a common man. A physician calculates the height of the giant of other days at 12 or 13 feet. And January 5th, 1858, the Adair County News reports yet another excavation of giant human bones from an Indian mound on Harrison Robinson's farm. Author George Elbert Hart listing discoveries of giant human skeletons in his book, Mysterious Creatures, claims that similar finds have been made in, in Allen, Carroll, and Christian counties, but he provides no further detail. Kentucky's last published report of giant human remains came from Holly Creek in Brethin County during 1965. Local resident Kenneth White was building cattle stalls adjacent to a stone formation near his home when he uncovered a perfectly preserved skeleton eight feet nine inches tall with a skull that measured 30 inches in circumference. White showed the bones to folklorist Michael Henson who later described them in his book Tragedy at Devil's Hollow and more Kentucky ghost stories. Kentucky and Ohio are separated just by the Ohio River. Some of the stuff going on on one side is also going on on the other. And this one just I found of interest because it says skeleton of a giant that antedates Adam. Pre-Adam? I thought Adam was the... Well, if Adam was the first human, then these guys were before that. In Ohio in 1885, Five prehistoric giant skeletons unearthed from burial mound, the largest being eight feet in height, with a skull, with a huge skull the size of a peck basket. It was an elongated skull. Sepulture containing the skeletons of prehistoric giants is unearthed in Kentucky. Pine Grove, Kentucky. Evidences of a prehistoric race have been unearthed by Hugh Yates, a pro prosperous landowner of this county on his farm a few miles west of here. While excavating beneath a high cliff on this place, Mr. Yates came upon an immense grave containing a human skeleton. 
the frame was of giant proportions. His curiosity aroused, Mr. Yates called in some neighbors, and armed with picks, they burrowed their way into the side of the cliff and found an ancient sepulchre crowned with human skeletons, some of them larger than one first found. One of the frames measured 12 feet. Along with the skeletons were found curiously wrought jewels and strange ornaments, while cooking vessels and musical instruments of queer design were unearthed in great profusion. The diggers are still at work and expect to make even more important finds. A giant unearthed at Bowling Green measures nine feet in length. The skeleton of a prehistoric giant was exhumed near Bowling Green yesterday by a colored laborer who, who terrified at his find, ran breathless to the nearest farmhouse and notified the neighbors and notified the neighborhood. The skeleton, when placed together as, as it was in life, measures nearly nine feet in length. The skull measures almost 12 inches in diameter, and there are two distinct rows of teeth in the massive jaw. The bones are well preserved with the exception of the pelvic bones, which are considerably decayed. The bones were first brought to be the remains of some giant Indian, but the shape of the head is not the shape of the skull peculiar to Indians, and the age in which the man lived is still in doubt. The bones of the toes and fingers are remarkably well preserved and appear to have something resembling claws attached. The arms of the giant measure many inches more than those of man to day and wore the lower limbs not so long the skeleton would bear a close resemblance to a huge gorilla. There is no wound visible on the bones, and that the man died of natural death is quite probable. Mystery still surrounds Ohio County bones. Rockport, Kentucky. Did prehistoric giants roam the earth in Ohio County? Yes, two history books say... Definitely not, says Ken Carsons. In 1872, a dusty old skeleton allegedly unearthed near Rockport indicated a giant over 10 feet high, according to Lewis and Richard Collins' History of Kentucky. Long ago, too, an Ohio County man exhumed bones of enormous size close to the Green River, wrote Harrison D. Taylor and Mary Taylor Logan in Ohio County, Kentucky, in the olden days. Carsons, who teaches anthropology at Murray State University, said the bones may have been from a Native American burial. Anna Laura Duncan, a local historian in Hartford, in Hartford, the Ohio County seat, has heard the tales of prehistoric giants but hasn't seen proof. If any bones were found, I don't know where they would be. I, um, okay, she said. History of Kentucky. Published in 1874, claimed coal prospectors mined big bones about a mile from Rockport, which is also on the Green River. They dug down six feet and uncovered the complete skeleton of a human body of gigantic size, the historians wrote. The lower jawbone fitted over the lower portion of the man's face and partly of explorers completely covered it. The thigh bone from the hip bone to the knee was 42 inches long and the forearm bone from the wrist to the elbow measured 22 inches long. This would indicate the giant of over 10 feet high. Carsons can't account for the supposed size of the bones, but he doubts the dimensions were accurate. The late Robert Render Sr., a gentleman well-known and highly esteemed for his many virtues, used to relate finding a mound or grave near Green River in which bones were of enormous size, reported the Taylor Logan book published in 69. Render was large bone himself, over six feet tall, the author said. It, esti it is estimated that the bones belong to a human one-third larger than Mr. Render, who ranked among the largest men in the county. Taylor and Logan don't say when Render found the bones, and their book is silent about what became of the remains. It is now a subject of regret that this grave has not been thoroughly examined by a scientific man and a full skeleton 
procured of this semi-giant race, the authors wrote. Carson said giants never inhabited Ohio or any other place else in America. There was a popular myth in the 19th century that mound builders were giant people wiped out by the Indians. Yeah, that's true. There were even stories that mound builders were Europeans, not Native Americans, Carson said. He said the myth was perpetuated to discredit the Indians and to justify stealing the Indians' land. Yes, it was to justify stealing the Indians' land, to say that they were not of another race. That's That was the justification. Oh, well, discovery of giant skeletons. A splendid haul of giant skeletons is reported from Homer in the United States. And I believe they mean Homer, Kentucky. The district is a prolific field of Indian mounds, and important discoveries are continually being made there. On the 4th, beneath a small mound at 5 feet below the normal surface, five gigantic skeletons with their feet to the east were found in a grave with a stone floor. Remnants of burned bones and charcoal were plentiful in the grave, together with numerous stone vessels and weapons. The skeletons were there of veritable giants, and no mistake, the head of one being the size of a wooden bucket. Each of the giants must have been at least nine feet in height. Among others striking something in the grave was a beautiful finished stone pipe, the bowl being large and polished and engraved with figures of birds. And this is especially interesting, showing that the use of tobacco does not always, as alleged by stone medical authorities, stunt growth. (laughs) Oh, that's funny. There was beside the pipe a huge knife shaped like a sickle and having a wooden handle held by leather thongs. Also a kettle holding about six quarts. It is said by those who are most competent to give an opinion in the matter that this is by far the most valuable find of giants over made in America and probably one of the oldest. It is well known fact that the bones of elephants, rhinoceroses, mastodons and other huge animals have before now been exhibited and accepted as proof of prehistoric giants. The presence, however, in the grave at Homer of the pipe and kettle is conclusive proof that the skeletons are not only of genuine, but also of genuine giants. Adina were the name of the mound builders from Kentucky. It's not clear how they differentiate between the Adena, the Hopewell, and the Fort Ancient. I don't know why, what makes one stop and one start. That's unclear. They were running the place. Earthworks, mounds, the Ohio River Valley for thousands of years. At the time of the arrival of the Spaniards, the Fort Ancient along the Ohio River Valley disappeared in 1700 AD. Let's look at the mound builders that tried to stick it out, either by fighting or by trying to make allies. I've learned about the Timuqua, the Tequesta, the Calusa, the Natchez. Those groups tried to stick it out. Those groups were murdered to extinction. So this Ohio River Valley is occupied by them for thousands of years, and the Native Americans were never able to penetrate or interrupt that cycle until either they disappeared or until they started getting attacked from all sides, and then the Native Americans were able, certain groups of Native Americans, not all tribes, warriors were able to, they were all, they just piled on. If any mound builder culture that tried to tough it out. So if you ask me, the ones that disappeared did the smart thing. 
with the timing, it's obviously the reason that they disappeared. As far as the relationship between Bigfoot and giants, that's still a bit of a mystery. In the places where the mound builders disappeared, like the Anasazi disappeared, I believe they're still there. In a lot of these places in Kentucky, there was no takeover like there was, you know, with the Natchez, you know, Tamuqua, Tequesta. When they came in contact, they were wiped out. And Kentucky's underground is mammoth, as in the name of one of the underground cave systems there. And there's a lot of stuff going on in that area as well, which I love that they kept it nice and wild. The woods around Mammoth. Prehistoric man like us. New evidence discovered near Wycliffe, Kentucky. I think it's pronounced Wycliffe. Prehistoric man had a cellar, made whoops, and probably had a headache the next a.m., the evidence was unearthed by Colonel and Mrs. Fane W. King, who announced their find here. Four perfect juice presses and ports sufficient for the restoration of 12 others have been excavated from mounds at the confluence of the Ohio and Mississippi rivers near here. The race, which is believed to have inhabited the mounds area long before America was discovered, did not know the art of distillation, but evidently knew all about fermentation. We concluded herbs, fruits, and products of the forest were placed in these containers, pressed, and the juice drained into another vessel and allowed to drip. We believe it was by this method the ancients manufactured their fire water. According to heritage.kentucky.gov documents native history, Kentucky teachers, the earliest people in Kentucky is over 11,000 years long. The first people arrived around 9,500 BC and then lasted until 1539 and then it says foreign influences, meaning that was the cause of their end. So from, they lived there since 9,500 BC. And then upon the arrival of the Europeans, done. And then after that, from 1539 to 1730, they say it was the intersection of two worlds. That's when the Iroquois were taking over. Once the mound builders left, the Iroquois came in and took over. I'll be learning more about the Iroquois to, in uh, future episodes, but I do know that they, they were allies with some of the Europeans, and they, so they were supplied with weapons, and they, they performed several acts of genocide over time of other Native American Tribes. I don't think at this point any of them were mound builders because it says that the Fort Ancient of that area disappeared. But it says that thousands of camps, villages, towns, sites, caves, rock shelters, earthen and stone mounds, and geometric earthworks existed by the groups living in Kentucky. And they began to build mounds and earthworks around 500 BC. Talking about the Adena, involved in some way with the later Hopewell culture, who also built mounds and earthworks. The Dino were hunter-gatherers, and then the Hopewell, I think, began agriculture. There were two groups. The group lived west of the falls were called the Mississippians, and the groups who lived east of the falls were called the Fort Ancient. And these people were the immediate ancestors of the Indian groups living in Kentucky when the first European explorers that appeared in eastern Kentucky they were there when the first Europeans arrived, the Mississippians and the Fort Ancient, who were basically the same, but just in different areas. Now, the Mississippians, the Natchez, were the true biological ancestors to the Mississippians, mound builders. They were all killed. 
because they didn't go into hiding. More on the Natchez later. More on those groups later. But so far, that's what I've got. There is a place called the Slack Farm site. And in 1987, 10 looters paid the farm $10,000 for the right to dig at the site. After renting a tractor, the 10 individuals spent two months destroying hundreds of Native American graves, Mississippian culture houses, and other unknown artifacts. The damage done to the slack farm attracted worldwide attention, was written about in the National Geographic magazine, and prompted widespread outcry against illicit removal of antiquities. I would not be surprised if they were paid by the Smithsonian to do that. Would not be surprised at all. The motivation behind that seems very deliberate. I could totally see that being the Smithsonian's doing. The Slack Farm incident was a crime of vandalism. It drew worldwide attention because of how horrible it was. National Geographic spoke about it. And the Smithsonian says nothing, not then, not now. And they're supposed to be protectors of national treasures, the ones that give us all the facts. There's no mention from the Smithsonian of it. From 30 days of Kentucky archaeology.wordpress.com Slack Farm 30 years ago. This is an aerial view of the Slack Farm shortly after the looting was halted. 1987. As we wandered from hole to hole, the scale of destruction and the number of graves the looters had de desecrated really hit me. I had visited and documented looted sites before, but I had never seen looting on this scale and intensity. There were human remains everywhere. Skulls sat on top of black dirt piles, and the remains of infants and children were scattered about the surface. I recall one state police officer saying, even if looting graves in Kentucky is not against the law, it certainly is immoral. Eventually, we turned the work at hand, doing our best to conduct preliminary damage assessments, taking photographs and collecting evidence. At the end of our visit, we had, a su we had sufficient evidence to charge the looters with 34 counts of grave desecration. And in 1988, it was only a misdemeanor to disturb graves in Kentucky. In neighboring states until the late 1980s, it was not illegal to disturb unmarked graves. And in some states, even if marked graves older than a certain date were not located in a perpetual care cemetery, deserved no protection. And the sobering truth was that in 1987 across the, the Ohio River, in nearby Indiana and Illinois, and in most other states, what the looters did at Slack Farm would not have been illegal. Because of Slack Farm in 1988, the governor of Kentucky and legislature strengthened Kentucky's laws dealing with the protection of cemeteries, and it is now a fel felony to loot or disturb any human remains. I believe the public outcry surrounding the Slack Farm contributed to the passage of the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. Specifically, it needed to determine how many Native American graves had been desecrated. 450 looter holes associated back dirt piles in less than three months. As capable as our crew of five professional archaeologists was, we recognized that if they were going to document more than 450 looter holes and associated back dirt piles in less than three months, they would need help. So the call went out for volunteers. Some 500 people from the public and professional archaeologists responded. And so was born Wednesday wash nights for more than four years. A dedicated group helped process the hundreds of thousands of artifacts recovered from the slack farm damage. Though the looters did severely impact the cemeteries, much of the village remains and it says, I would estimate that about 90% of the site is still intact. And so 90% of the site is still intact because they were focusing strictly on destroying the bones in the cemeteries. This was very intentional. They didn't steal anything. They destroyed things. And the Smithsonian says nothing when it draws worldwide attention. And the Smithsonian is supposed to be in care of all of our national archaeology and knowledge of 
you know, the past in North America, but they don't say a word. They still haven't said a word, in fact. 650 to 750 graves were opened by the looters, and then it says archaeologists speculate that as many as a thousand or more people could have been buried at the seven cemeteries at the site. In searching for anything related to the Smithsonian about the Slack Farm incident, I found this incredibly detailed report, and the Smithsonian was actually mentioned in it. In the first couple pages, it says, Locals had known about the Indian site on the Slack family's farm for decades. As early as 1871, Sidney Lyons had mentioned it in a brief survey report filed with the Smithsonian Institution. The fact that Smithsonian came out there and did a survey before this incident happened. That's the only thing I can find about the Smithsonian and this incident. And this was not a case of looting because nothing was ever retrieved from the looters. They were there literally to destroy the bones and that's what they focused on was the bones. I wonder why. I wonder what the bones could have been hiding that the Smithsonian wouldn't have liked the public to know about. Gems I would most want to go looking for in Kentucky would be fluorite. Northwestern part of Kentucky that borders in Illinois is known as the fluorite district. But not only is that fluorite district producing some really high quality fluorite, some of the mountain artifacts that were recovered are, are made out of fluorite. They're statues, tools, and they're very beautiful. Fluorite comes in purple, green, yellow, and mixtures of those colors. Now, there are some rules when it comes to taking rocks from Kentucky. You have to be sure to avoid private property, of course, but you also might need to get a permit from the Department of Natural Resources to take rocks. Big Bone Lick State Historic Site, located in Northern Kentucky, has tons of artifacts and a museum. Thank you so much for watching, liking, and subscribing. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, bye!